Hey everyone, hopefully you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel's Finding Value. Uh, today we're gonna go through Twitter like we normally do in the mornings. Um, I'm gonna interject my financial opinions uh, as we go through it, generally related to three different topics, wealth building, commodities, and financial topics uh, is what we're going to cover. And we can dive right in and see what people are sharing on social media. And I'm also sharing a couple of things on there as well that we will go over. Uh, if you want to follow me, it's at Finding Your Score Finance. And if you want to join our community, FindingHypeValue.com, where I dive deeper into these topics and sectors. I do a lot of training sessions uh, to get people up to speed on how to play this commodity bull market and why the commodity bull market is occurring. Uh, in my opinion, everything is interconnected and it is all signs of a larger, bigger picture view of what's coming. And I'm sure you guys want to know my opinion on what's coming. I think a commodity bulls mar bull market uh, and also precious metals are going to do insane things uh, from 2020 onward. That's when I got incredibly bullish on commodities. So we do have a coupon code May Day that is still going on. And if you're a monthly member and want to switch to a yearly membership, you can also enjoy further savings uh, by using that disc uh, discount coupon code. So coming down, we've got emerging markets looking well positioned. So this is something that I posted. We've got the three hump consolidation that I usually talk about and a potential breakout. Well, we are breaking out uh, of a double bottom here in the short, short on the shorter time frame. What does that mean? When does emerging markets break out? Um, that's the question all of you viewers should be asking. When does emerging markets do well? When the dollar falls? when the DXY falls, when the Canadian uh, dollar outperforms the US dollar, and we can yank up all of these different charts. And you know what they are suggesting? They are suggesting that we could see the dollar fall. It uh, doesn't mean it will happen immediately because sometimes we see money flows um, go into these assets before the actual outcome of the dollar falling, it's it's money positioning before that occurs. Uh, so we are tracking big money, you know, money movements in the markets uh, that are large enough to make the markets move, and we're tracking those money movements with these charts. And if you have enough experience to know what does well under certain market conditions, then you kind of can paint a picture of where we're at in the cycle, what interest rates could potentially do uh, on a probability standpoint. Um, nothing's 100% set in stone, but we could say, you know what, the dollar's probably going to drop based off of positioning in the market. They're probably printing a lot more money, uh, even though that may, you know, we might have a delay in seeing it in the data, but that's why Bitcoin, and gold and silver are all rocketing higher because they go up generally when, uh, so they, they, they can go up when money is printed or they front run when money is going to be printed uh, because it's the insiders that have insider information and they are positioning in these markets before that news is announced. So we're tracking the money positioning before the actual move occurs. And we know that usually occurs when we have an inverted yield curve, which we do. So finally, here's another one from myself. Uh, URA looking like last bull market and the fractal looks similar to last bull market. Uranium is bullish and we should remain bullish in my opinion. Check out that lead-in pattern. It is almost identical. Here's the big move lower, the potential bottom here. And then we've got a nice fractal overlay that looks exactly similar uh, to previous bull markets. And we are moving on up. I dragged it a little bit lower so you can see how the movements are behaving. Uh, uh, these little movements here, people get all scared out. <laughs> I've just been riding this, guys. Uh, I've been riding it. And I guess uh, those who can ride these bull markets and stay steady are ultra rare. Um, and I guess people get scared out. They try to take profits when they're up like 100%. And I'm over here trying to ride these things as long as I can. 
Uh, so I'm still riding it. I think all of the market conditions look absolutely fantastic for a continued move uh, in a lot of these different commodity sectors. Um, I comment, silver squeeze is alive and well. Let's hope we can finish the year out strong and get this turtle head of a chart, a breakout here. So this is silver on a yearly or 12 month candlestick. So each of these candlesticks is a year. You can see the big pattern. It is a cup and handle continuation pattern, and we're starting to break to the upside. This is like a dream within a dream, and the, the dream within a dream is this cup and handle, and then we have a smaller cup and handle here. And then if you, you dive in, there's another break that we just broke out um, on a very short-term time frame. So we're breaking on basically every single time frame, uh, the short, the middle, and the long term. You've heard people say uh, that you can be bullish and bearish at the same time uh, on different time frames. So you could have a bullish setup on a long-term time frame and have a bearish setup on a, on a short-term time frame. What is setting up in silver here is a bullish outcome on all time frames. This is where the big kahuna and the big energy gets released is this is the setup that we wait for. We wait for a setup that gets bullish on all time frames. And this doesn't occur very often because the big long-term bullish setup took since 1980. The setup had to occur from 1980. So we're 40 plus years into this setup. And you know what also coincides with 40 years? A declining interest rate environment that has just broken to the upside. And you guys have, I mean, you know this, I talk a lot about interest rates and why that is such a big deal and how money rotates differently. This is what is occurring. Money is rotating differently. And this is what the breakout looks like. It's happening right in front of our eyes. It's occurring. And everyone's like, well, I wonder if silver is going to get a pullback. I'm like, guys, we're breaking on all time frames. You should be positioned. You should be holding here. And if you want there are still opportunities in some of these higher risk junior companies that haven't moved yet, or they haven't moved a ton off the bottom yet. Um, getting 100% or 200% gain, which some of these have already moved off the bottom, is still very early in the move. And, and to be great at these things is to get the great early entry points and just sit and wait. Sit and wait for this to all play out. And it's very difficult for people to do because they think investing is like work. The more effort you put in, the more you get out. And I would disagree. It's about, it's, it's about playing a game of chess. It's about positioning first for the ultimate move that's to come. And you have to have patience. You have patience here where it's like, you know what? I've been positioning in silver for a while. I've purchased the living crap out of silver's bottom in the physical market and platinum as well. And people were calling me like, platinum hasn't done anything for 14 years. I'm like, yeah, you're not that smart then because <laughs> you gotta, you have to position when everyone else hates it. I was going in and buying this stuff with premiums that were just nothing, silver and platinum. And then I sat and I waited and guess what? It did take years. It did take four, five, six, seven, eight years. But I've got a freaking, you know, a, a, a huge vault of this stuff, so to speak. And now we're breaking out. It's all playing and playing out in front of our eyes. So I think this is gonna be a this is gonna be a ridiculous move here. It's gonna be ridiculous. Uh, major crossroads seems important. The DXY, I'm talking about when emerging markets does well, the dollar drops. It's all interconnected. The dollar dropping is going to send precious metals priced in dollars higher. It's all interconnected. And here's the DXY where we could get a breakdown in the shorter term here. You know, this is 2024 where we could get a breakdown here. It hasn't occurred yet, but guess what's occurring? People are positioning for... That exact outcome, even uranium priced in dollars and these equities, if we get a dollar drop, all of these commodities are going to rip. 
Think of it as 2002. The Canadian to USD is also squeezing up. Not saying it's broken out yet, but it's squeezing up. Here's Bitcoin on the move this morning. It's not Bitcoin moving up. It's the dollar dropping. And people are moving into these assets to protect against the dollar. Go check gold in any other currency. It's just ripping it. The dollar is next, in my opinion. And we can see a lot of these assets just absolutely rip in terms of dollar value. Moving on down, invest in the blue countries when I would say Calvin is exactly right. So this is the state of global fertility, fertility rate by country in 2021, which is births per women. And wherever there's large population growth, that's where you want to be positioned because you're growing in those countries. You're growing your loans. You're growing your um, houses that need to be built. Uh, your economy is growing and everywhere else it is not growing. That's why Japan's housing market and their economy has gone down since the 1990s. It's their demographic. They just don't have that demographic to, to grow into. So that's what it's all being driven by. This is your leading indicator. And you can be 30 years early on this. You've got 30 years because generally, generally speaking, when, when you go into first-time homebuyers, you need to see the demographic bulge at that 30-ish age range. Now, some countries are earlier, some countries are later. We're later in America. We're more like first-time home buyers are 36 years old, I think. It could even be later than that now. But that's what it was a few years ago when I looked at it. So the we're right in the thick of a big demographic buying homes, ha starting families, and uh, increased demand to buy all the crap that needs to go in the home. Um, oil doing a retest before surging higher. Do we have a final retest still to do? Uh, gold generally leads oil by 18 to 19 months. Looks incredibly bullish to me. Uh, here's oil, one, two, three. We got the circle, one, two, three. We got the circle there that's ready to rip. Um, gold, which is our leading indicator of liquidity, is ripping. Uh, you can see it broke out there. It broke out in, it bottomed in October of 2022. So we're getting really close to that window here for oil uh, to take off. And nobody wants oil to take off because that is what translates this liquidity. Uh, it goes through oil and then it goes and translates into the consumer price index. And nobody wants that. So you're, what you're going to see is you're going to see the producer price index go up first. Then you'll see your consumer price index go up next. Uh, and that's all filtering through the system right now. Looks absolutely beautiful there. Mike Zaccardi says, gas prices deflated by average hourly earnings are about where they were in 1991. Uh, unchanged from 2004, down 50% from July 2008 high, down 30% from 10 years ago. Uh, so I wanted to talk about this. I, I'm talking about this here. People read that data and they'll say, well, there's no big problem. They don't know how to read charts. Um, this thing's lining up for a monster move to the upside. So this data, while it's correct, uh, it, it really doesn't tell you anything. It's just a arbitrary area that people arbitrarily select and say, okay, this is the data here. You need to draw your, your, your resistance lines through. You got a one, two, three hump consolidation, a breakout of that resistance and a retest. We're at that retest. We are going to see gas prices, in my opinion, go up a lot. Go up a lot. I'm talking like, a lot, a lot. <laughs> like here, we hit like peak gas prices. Um, I think we hit something like four-ish dollars here in Colorado, low fours maybe. Um, we're gonna go and probably double that. We're gonna go to like eight dollars a gallon, nine dollars a gallon. Uh, people will say, "Well, how are people going to afford that?" Um, I'm gonna say the opposite. How many people need to get priced out to balance the market? And, and to balance the inflation that's coming in the system. Um, I don't think people understand how much inflation I think is going to come. And the panic that could be created from that and maybe even unrest uh, is what I'm suggesting. Uh, silver ripping today. We have some big moves in silver. Absolute 
uh, massive move today. Uh, this is a kind of a longer picture view, or that's a shorter picture view. That's or this is zoomed in. That's a daily candlestick there. Uh, this is zoomed out. Um, it's hard to believe that the daily candlestick is that big. <laughs> uh, but yeah, silver's looking really good. Uh, we've got Market Sniper here. He's posting the gold to silver ratio. It says there will there will be those that know not to short silver into the post XAU XAG trigger in subsequent gold silver ratio likely disorderly decline. And those that will find out uh, the GSR of 65 comes up sooner than many expect is our prediction uh, all the way down to 65. Uh, so what does that mean? What is 65 ratio? So if gold's, I'm just going to use 2400 as a gold price. We're bringing out the calculator, guys. Uh, so it's 2400 divided by 65. That means a silver price of 37 bucks is coming quick. 37 bucks. It's about five-ish dollars, a little more than five dollars away. That's what's coming in his opinion. We've got a game of trades. Japan's population has now been contracting for almost 15 years. At the same time, number of vacant homes there has risen significantly, now reaching 9 million marked. At this rate, Japan's demography poses long-term sustainability risks for their economy. Correct. When your population declines, you get a declining real estate market. When your real estate market declines, you get falling tax revenues you get um, falling home prices, and you have falling credit expansion in the system. Uh, so all of these systems are basically designed for inflation. Uh, they want higher tax revenues, uh, higher property taxes, um, increased spending, et cetera, et cetera. You've got this system that must and it must grow. Otherwise, you get a debt to GDP problem, and then the system starts to collapse. And Japan is probably just further along uh, in that collapse of their currency system and the way that the system is designed, because the design of the system is built around a growing population, not a declining population. Uh, investment wisdom, never fall in love with a stock. Always have an open mind. I think Peter Lynch must be talking about a hotter stock uh, that he's found in the market. Uh, maybe one that's got better value. Uh, but never fall in love with the stock is what he says. Don't ever marry it. Um, I guess you just date it. Always have an open mind. And hopefully, you know, I don't know exactly what he's talking about here. But uh, Eric, so Eric says, Goldman, under no scenario will the demand for oil in 2040 fall below current levels. With peak shale looming in the next several years, this has a profound read-through to the value of low decline, long life inventory, like Canadian oil sands, liquid rich, Montney, Duvernay. Um, I am exactly in those uh, investments. And again, guys, if you wanna know what those investments are, um, and you can sign up to the, to the community there in the website. But we talk about those, I chart them. I, we talk about them all the time in the Discord channel that we've got about the potential opportunities that are coming ahead of us. Um, this here is the EV slow adoption case implies oil demand increasing towards 113 million barrels per day by 2040 uh, is the estimate. Wow, that's a big move to the upside. And the EV slow adoption is this top line here. And I think the people who are pushing the EV you know, adoption where we're just going to adopt everything like Kathy Wood, they're going to be really wrong. Really, really wrong. Warren Pye says, here's an overly simple rule, stock market rule that's worked for a few years. Long the S&P 500 when oil is less than $90 a barrel. Cash when oil is greater than 90 a barrel. Since 2021, this rule of thumb has kept all drawdowns contained and captured the most upside. Oil drives inflation vibes expectations. I totally agree with that. And that's the strategy that he... Um, Kind of lives by, but what if oil goes way up? <laughs> might take some might take some years still, but I think oil is going to go way, way, way up. Uh, I totally agree with Calvin here. He says learning monetary history is in itself an act of rebellion. Uh, the more you dive into money and history, it'll just blow your mind. You'll 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 blow your mind at just how corrupt politicians and governments are, and and then it, everything makes sense. 
Uh, they're not going to teach this in school, like high school or even college, because uh, it's pretty nasty when you start looking into it. And then if you can start reading chart patterns and seeing kind of how money flows before news comes out, then you get even worse off because you're like, wait a minute, how did everyone know before these things occurred that 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 was going to occur? Like, like people had insider information before these big events occurred, which then makes you think it's like, wait, how did they have insider information before the events occurred? Which means the events were planned. And then you say, okay, well, how did they have, it just goes down this huge rabbit hole where you're just like, wait a minute, this is not cool. <laughs> Um, you are a monthly bullish or bearish. This is absolutely bullish. If this, if anyone says this is a bearish chart, they need to get slapped. They need to get slapped. Uh, behind every stock, there's a business. What's behind crypto? Uh, good question. Uh, some people say it's this network. Oh, it's the network that's behind crypto. Um, I'd like to see the design of crypto. Um, when the Bitcoin mining companies are not subsidized by the Bitcoins themselves, all of that cost is going to be transferred as fees. And I don't think crypto, or I should say, I don't think Bitcoin will survive those fees. I think it will go to, um, I don't know if it'll go to zero. I think it will get frozen. Um, Andrew and I, we've talked about this before. Um, there could be a time where the fees get so great where nobody wants to transact Bitcoin and then the price gets frozen uh, at, a, at, a, at a certain level. Uh, so let's say it costs $200,000 to mine a Bitcoin uh, and Bitcoin price is $50,000. Um, your fees could potentially be so big that nobody wants to transact because of the fee let's say it's some just ridiculous fee to do it and they don't want to transact it. So could there be a time where Bitcoin falls to a level and the fee is greater than the cost or price of Bitcoin? Um, again, another thing to think about is all Bitcoin will eventually end up in dead people's accounts and be wiped off the face of the earth. Um, I don't know how you can reclaim that. Maybe they can steal those things out of the accounts. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's that secure of a network. A lot of people getting things stolen. Uh, that is Bitcoin and even I think Ethereum too. I hear a lot about people getting you know things stolen. So I don't I don't know what's going to occur, but um, I think that people don't want crypto. They just got sucked into it because they want what crypto can buy. They think it's going to go up to some ludicrous amount, and they want the uh, the thing that crypto can buy. They don't actually use crypto uh, to buy things or transact. So the use case, uh, I'm very skeptical on. Uh, yes, there are some use cases that people can can come up with, but uh, I also think that the network is fragile. Uh, I think it could be very, how can I say it? it it's, it's out in the open. So if people want to find out who owns what and and all that stuff, I think that's a bad idea, not a good idea, but I don't, I'm not into it, what I'll say. Rock bottom entries, pullbacks are becoming less severe and lasting less time. We've begun the next leg of the parabolic melt up in silver, in his opinion. Um, all I'm going to say is I don't know what's going to occur Tuesday because the market is somewhat, you know, it's not, it's trading, but there's not a lot of volume in it. We'll see what occurs Tuesday and how it closes, what I'll say. Uh, investment wisdom says no matter how great the talents or efforts, some things just take time. Uh, that's how I approach the market. I get positioned and I'm ultra patient. And then I just wait for all this stuff to play out with time. Uh, I use the charts as my guide uh, and the ratios that are cheap. If I start to acquire assets when they're cheap. I take a long enough time frame for them to develop. Uh, and then I get paid. Um, most people that I would say one of the, the biggest problems that I see, even in the comment section on a lot of YouTube videos, is people are not patient enough. Uh, they try to play the short term. Oil's going up. Now, could there be a pullback before we go up? All I'm going to say is good luck trying to time the short term, guys. Good luck. Good luck. I'm not there to try to time a, a three-month or six-month pullback. 
then you're going to say, well, that's an opportunity wasted. And I'll be like, okay, your returns against my returns. What I'll say. Can you actually materially gain from that market movement and beat other market players? Um, I can just say this. How many billionaires are on, um, how many billionaires are short-term traders? The most successful trader, Jesse Livermore, they, that's who they attribute to be the most ex- successful uh, trader. Uh, what he had to do is he had to adopt a longer holding period to, to be as successful as he was. Uh, but uh, Buffett, I think, would absolutely wax him because Jesse was more or less, if, if you read his books and you read kind of the history on him, was more or less a gambler. So he made a ton of money, lost it all, made a ton of money, lost it all, made a ton of money, lost it all. And, and that's your best trader is losing all your money. So basically he piled on bets. He was right some of the time and then lost all his money. Now, the people who have been right and have really made money in a long, sustaining way have been Buffett, uh, Peter Lynch, and all these kind of types. Stanley Druckenmiller is another one. And they're all long-term, well, not, maybe not Stanley Druckenmiller, but some of these guys are long-term investors. So what they're doing is their holding period is longer than the cycles, the, the short-term cycles. Uh, and then they just play really good companies over the long term uh, where their products don't get cycled out. So I Warren Buffett's not in a lot of tech stocks. He's in some of them, but he's not in a ton. He's in like food companies, insurance companies, energy companies, like, like the boring stuff. Uh, they don't get cycled out. They're needed no matter what. So he just plays them over all of those different cycles. So that's kind of what he does and how he's made all his money. And he hasn't gone really broke like some of these traders are. So I'm not, I don't adopt the trading mentality. Uh, I think it's a loser mindset, in my opinion, to try to trade the very short-term mindset because it doesn't work. That is what I've found. And that's what I've seen uh, when looking at history and who's been successful and unsuccessful. So if you look at the shorter time frames and look at the statistics, if you see day traders, they almost all lose their money completely. Then you start increasing your time frame. Uh, you go to months, you go to years, you go to decades. And the success of those people as you lengthen your time frame goes up and up and up and up. So I try to adopt as much as I can uh, but with the statistics and background that I've researched to try to implement it into the strategies that I am adopting and apply and applying to the market. So the precious metals, uh, the boiling water advisory says at 211 degrees Fahrenheit, water is merely hot, uh, steaming as it simmers quietly on the cusp of a transformation. Yet at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, a mere one degree difference ushers in an intense transformation. Water begins to boil, uh, releasing powerful steam capable of powering a freight train. It's that one single degree that makes all the difference, a tiny shift that marks a powerful change. There's no going back. Gold is hitting the boiling point. Gold just hit uh, $2,400 per ounce, marking yet another record high for the metal this year. It is up nearly 15% year to date, and since January 2023, it is up 30%. So it's really ripped into the upside there. Nice little retest on top there. Um, so that looks fantastic. Silver is following it. Same with platinum. Platinum is going to rip too. Um, here's Kevin Bambro. He says, I totally agree. The precious metals breakout is a sign of currency failure and the move isn't going to be small. People have been brainwashed to take nearly all their savings and give it to bankers and brokers and mostly in a 60-40 stock bond portfolio as they age. The result of decades of this marketing is that the stock market has become obscenely valued. All risk, little reward. The panic into precious metals that will follow this fiat bubble blind investing era will send metal prices skyward. Like boiling a frog slowly, the average investor has grown content with to just stay in the market despite valuations not making sense. The inflation that's coming is going to devastate. I actually agree with Kevin there. I think we are going to have a, a huge inflationary surge here. Uh, and you're either in this stuff or you're not. 
Uh, so that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of what I think, and I agree with him. Uh, but that's where I'm going to end it, guys. That's what I've got for today. Give me a thumb up for the content. Subscribe to the channel. Subscribe to the website if you guys like. And uh, we'll catch you guys later. This is Finding Value.